hand over to Norman now. Uh, Norman's the county moth reporter for Breckenshire, and I describe him as an eminent mothologist. So um, that's my probably my made up word for today. I don't think Norman's ever been called a mothologist before, but he's got an immense amount of knowledge of moths. And, he... and uh, yes, you're going to hear about a beginner's guide to moth chopping in mid Wales and probably one or two other things as well, because I can't stick to the subject entirely. So here we go. This is what I'm hoping to say, how to find moths, the techniques for, for doing so and trapping, identification, some common moths, some rarities, recording, and a bit about trends in numbers and distribution. So I'm hoping to cover all of that this evening. So there are various ways of finding moths. You can find them in the daytime. And of course, one way of finding them is on flowers when they're nectaring, because moths, like butterflies, uh, feed, feed on nectar from flowers. And so they're the six spot burners. You can tell they're the six spot burners because they've got six spots. And if I can find my, because of one, two, three, four, five, six. There's also a five spot burnet, which has got five spots. But sadly, there's also a narrow bordered five spot burnet, which also have five spots and looks almost exactly like a five spot burnet. So things are never quite as simple as they might seem sometimes, but the six spot burnet is easy to, to identify and very common. Flying in June in the, in the sunshine, feeding on thistles and things of that kind. So nectaring is a good way of finding uh, moths in the daytime. But Moths also rest in the daytime. And sometimes they rest and camouflage themselves. There's a find the moth on that uh, slide there. It's really well camouflaged. And of course, if you, you can walk past that and not be able to see it at all. So some moths rest and camouflage themselves so they don't get eaten by birds. Or they can do this. They can employ subterfuge. They can say, they can hide in plain sight. I'm not a moth at all. I'm a bird dropping, as this one says. This one's a clouded magpie. Now then, most moths fly in the night time. Some moths fly in the daytime. And the reason why they, they fly those times is that ones at night time avoid being eaten by birds, and ones in the daytime avoid being eaten by bats. But then, of course, you can have some that try to avoid both of them. That's the, the ghost moth, which flies at dusk and dawn. But even then, it's a rather sad story because it's white and it hovers and it, what it's doing is lecking like, like a bird. It's waiting for a, a female to come along and mate with it. But you can imagine even at dusk and dawn, a white moth hovering like this over grass is an awfully obvious thing to see. And uh, sadly, a lot of them do get taken by birds, but then they provide food for birds anyway. So I suppose that's fair enough. I see these at dusk. I'm afraid I don't see things at dawn very much. In fact, I'm hardly aware there is a thing called a dawn. It's supposed to be early morning, they tell me, but um, I don't often see it. So the best way is that most moths fly at night. And so if you want to find them at night time, that's, you need to employ various methods. One of them is light trapping. I like this photograph of my, my light trapping because it shows that what happens in times when, when we're not socially distanced. Of course, you can't do that now, but in, in earlier times, Around the mount of the trap, there's lots of people's heads, and around the outside, lots of people's bottoms. And that's that's moth trapping. That's social moth trapping. So that's the, the method I'm going to concentrate on most of the time today, this evening, but also there are some other methods as well. And I'll just whiz through some of the other methods. Light trapping is easy to do on a regular basis, though. You have lots of moths, and that's why I recommend that people start around about now, because there aren't too many species flying now. You don't get too confused. Skinner trap. Let me just find out where I am on my. Uh... Yeah. This is the, the three basic types of moth trap, but they all employ the same thing. They employ the ultraviolet lamp, which is here on the surface on the the top of the trap, and that's, that is the actually attractive thing that attracts the moths to the the trap. Then you put plastic, sheet plastic here and here, the moths get attracted, they drop down inside and land on the egg boxes. That's a Skinner trap, That's a, 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 a wooden Skinner trap. That was new about 10 years ago. I'm afraid it's coming to the end of its life now. It's just about falling to pieces. So I'm, I'm changing over to a different kind. That's the, one of the three different types. The other, there's the heat trap, which is a smaller one and usually used by people who are wanting something mobile. So you can use a Skinner trap, uh, a heat trap, 
with a smaller bulb and a battery. You can carry that around the countryside. There's also the round, big round trap called the Robinson trap, which is usually used with a more powerful lamp and gets more moss, even more moss than the Skinner trap. And that's what you see in the moth trap. That was really quite an exciting day because morning, because that was a little little flame carpet on that was there. And here was this enormous great convolvulus hawk. The only time I've ever had a convolvulus hawk in my trap. It was enormous. And I always find found when well, I, I found that was really interesting to see what happened to that convolvulus hawk moth, because you probably know it's a migrant, comes from southern Europe. And it migrated all the way flying northwesterly from southern Europe to my garden and lands in my moth trap. I thought I'd try and get it to lay eggs, but since it was a male, it wasn't very successful, I'm afraid. But uh, I thought, well, after a couple of nights, I'll let it go. So in the, in the dusk, when it was just getting dark, I opened the, 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 the um, container that had it in and watched it fly. And it flew up and around and around in ever increasing circles like that, up and up and up and up, and disappeared away, whoosh, to the northwest. It was a cloudy night with no moon, no sun. How did it know to go northwest? I'm not quite sure, but I think it's probably, I, I really don't know how they do that, but it was, it was very impressive anyway. Other techniques, as well as light, or a light trap. Very often it's useful to have the sheet, an ultraviolet light with a sheet, because then you can have a even more sociable occasion. Put the sheet on a, a large table and people can see the moss coming in and landing on the sheet. That was my very first uh, light um, experience about 40 years ago when I bought a, an ultraviolet light and a sheet. You used to catch the moths flying in and landing. Or you can, of course, remember moths feed on nectar from flowers, so you can duplicate that by using something called sugar. It's not really sugar at all, it's this strange looking concoction here. People have their own secret recipes for this stuff, which is supposed to attract moths, but it mainly in includes tre black treacle brown sugar and a beer and sometimes people have secret things to add as well. Personally I've never found it very successful but some people do. The next thing you can do with in terms of attracting moths to sweet or nectar, a nectar replacement is wine ropes. And this involves getting strips of, of uh, cotton or sheeting or something like that and dipping them in red wine and hanging them on on a, on a washing line kind of thing across between two trees. And this attracts some moths. It particularly attracts a moth called the old lady moth. And I find it quite amusing that the, um, the one moth that comes to wine ropes is the old lady. It doesn't though come to, to light hardly at all. So you don't often see it unless you, uh, in, unless you employ the, the, wine rope, the wine rope. And then you can also buy synthetic pheromones that attract the males of a species to what is presumably of a, a replica of the chemical that the females use to attract them. And that's a particularly useful for clear wings. I have tried over the years to use to use pheromones to find clear wings, and in Wales I've been really, really unsuccessful. They always say Norman's clear wings don't work. Norman's pheromones don't work. But once, just once, I was successful. There it is. The one time I managed to get a clear wing in, in England, I'm afraid it was. There's the the pheromone inside this tube, inside a, a bit of, uh, of black netting, dangling from a branch of a tree, and here, for once, is a clear wing arriving. Now, I had one of these old digital cameras that you, you press the button and it thinks about it for a bit and then it goes click eventually. And I thought I have no chance of getting a picture of a clear wing whizzing around because they fly around so fast. Anyway, I pointed the camera vaguely in the right direction, pressed the button, click, and lo and behold, that came out. I'm very proud of that, that particular photograph. Yeah, people do see moths in the daytime, but they don't record them. So we have very many fewer records in the daytime for daytime moths. So if you do see moths in the daytime, please remember to record them. Now identifying moths, books. I could, I suppose, have put a list of the various books you can get, but I am slightly nervous about putting, about publicising things in, in print, so to speak. But I've got quite a number of, in fact, I've got lots and lots of moth books. This one by Waring is, is a very good one, I find. Waring and Townsend. And it shows the moths 
in drawings or paintings like that, the way that you actually see them in real life. And a lot of people find this a very useful book. All there's one that I particularly like, which is Chris Manley's book, and Chris is from Swansea, so he's a good Welsh guy. Chris Manley called British Moss, the second edition. The second edition is much better than the first edition, and there's going to be a third edition coming out in June, so I'm waiting with bated breath for that. And well, what Chris does is takes photographs of moths, so that you actually have moth photograph pictures rather than drawings. They're very useful, but they're all the same size, so it doesn't give you an idea of the size, well, apart from the a little line on the side of the, of the picture. They're all the same size, so even a small moth comes out looking the same as a big one. The very tiny moths, like those, come out the same size as a hawk moth. So I find that useful. And then I'm about the only person who does find this one useful. This is Skinner. And here they have set specimens, pieces of set specimens, which is not the way you see the moth in real life, of course. And finally, if you want to know the distribution of moths, where, where to find them, then the atlas of, of moths is really good as well. I find this useful, but it's not an identification guide. It has pictures of moths, but it really shows you the, the distribution of them in, uh, in the British Isles. So I find that really useful, but perhaps not the first thing you would want to buy. Or you could go online. Of course, in the olden days, we didn't have online, so it wasn't um, wasn't available. But now there's a really good moth, um, moth site called UK Moths. And if you go on, if you Google UK UK Moths, you'll come across the site and you'll find really good information about all the, most of the species you can see. And finally, you could actually seek advice from more experienced recorders. I get lots of emails from people with um, with photographs attached, and sometimes I can identify the moth, and sometimes I can't. I always say though, please get the moth in focus. Some people try to get too close to the moth with their camera and it doesn't get into focus and all you see is a, a blur and I can't cope with that. Or they try to um, get very close and get it in focus and then they photoshop it. And again, it, it accentuates the, the, um, the characteristics but it doesn't really give you an idea of what the moth really looks like. So again, I say, please don't do that. Take a photograph some distance away in good focus and I'll, I'll have a chance. So feel free to send, well to me anyway, to send um, photographs and communicate with your experienced moth recorders in your county or your area. Corn moth flying now. Here's a spring five. These are the ones you see now in large numbers, comparatively large numbers. And here is the, what's my curse? This one is called the Hebrew character because it's got a a letter there, a Hebrew letter there, called the Noon letter, apparently. That's why it's called the Hebrew character. There's also another moth called the Cetaceous Hebrew character, which has got a similar kind of mark. Very common, the commonest of the spring five. This one is the Common Quaker. And the, the distinction, uh, distinctive feature of this one is the very round spots, markings on the wing can vary quite a lot in, in colour. Sometimes it's greyish, sometimes it's browner than that. That's the common Quaker. And this one is smaller than the common Quaker, so it's called the small Quaker. It's got smaller spots, usually paler and shorter winged. And you'll never guess what this one's called. This one's called the twin spotted Quaker. Bigger than the common Quaker and the small Quaker, and it's got these twin spots, usually. Unfortunately, just sometimes the twin spots are brown. So you've got brown spots against the background, a brown, a brown background, and they disappear. And I just find it quite difficult to explain to people why it's called a twin spot for Quaker when it doesn't have, any tw it doesn't have the twin spots, but sometimes it doesn't. Very sad story, I'm afraid. And finally, we have the clouded drab. And it's a very sad name for a really nice looking moth, very variable as well. It's about the same size as the twin spot of Quaker. And those five are closely related, they're all the genus Orthosia, and they're also to be found this time of year. Once you get to know these five, then you, you're more or less sorted for this, the early spring. There's one more moth, though, that you often see as well, and that's the early grey. So-called because it flies early in the year and it's grey. 
Well, actually, when it's first comes out of the, the pupa, when it's very fresh, sometimes it's got a nice pinkish tinge as well, so it's very attractive then. How are you doing for time? Plenty of time. The brindle beauty. This is one of the larger moths you get at this time of year. And you can see how well it's camouflaged against the, um, this, the old wood on the seat, my garden seat. I often put moths there because it looks rather like um, the, the trunk of a tree uh, with, with the lichen. So it's a good place to, um, to put moths for, for, for photography. But can you see I've, got, I've taken some distance away it's in focus, so you can see the moth. I haven't photoshopped it, it's natural, and this is really what the moth itself would look like in real life. And that's the way to try to produce a, a photograph for identification purposes. You can also, of course, take photographs for other purposes, for, for decorative purposes as well. A lot of people do that, and, and that's fine, but they're not necessarily particularly good for identification purposes. So remember the common moths are important as well as rare moths. Of course, everybody wants to know where the rare moths are and to, to protect them, but common moths are important as well. One reason is, of course, that they provide food for, for, for birds. So a very common moth like the large yellow odor, which is this one here, is a very important food source for all sorts of birds and bats as well. So common moths are, are very important in the, the whole of the um, biodiversity world. And they also, can be flagship species. Some of the, the, the species of moth, common moths, are ones that people recognize and notice. And I, I think the, these species tend to bring people into moths in the first place. So I think the flagship species are ones to, to, to look out for. And some moths, even though they're really common, are under-recorded because they're the exact opposite of the flagship species. The non-flagship species are ones that you see and don't record because you can't identify them or for other reasons or they're just boring looking and you think they must be boring. Some of the, the most interesting moths in fact are really quite unattractive and quite obscure. That's probably one of the reasons why they're, they're under recorded. I'm sure it is. Some moths are supposed to be common but actually when you look into it they're rarer than they used to be or rarer than they was thought. And again you think it's a common moth but maybe it isn't after all. Or there are some moths that are localized only common in your part of the world. And there are one or two moths even in Breckenshire that are like that. So what I would always say is, look at all the moths in your moth trap, don't ignore them, record them all, because some of them are, might, might be more important than you think. So this was mentioned by, by Ben earlier on, the flagship species, the elephant hawk moth. If there's one moth that I hear a lot about in, in the, throughout the, the mothing season is the elephant hawk. People ring me up, and that's fine. I'm quite happy for them to do that. Say, I've got this wonderful moth in my garden. It's pink and green and it's enormous great thing. What is it? And I say, have you got a moth book? Yes, I have. I look up elephant hawk and they look it up and say, oh yes, that's right, it is. And that's great. Somebody else has got interested in moths. And that's, that's really what I want to see. But also the elephant hawk has a, cat a caterpillar that's so interested as well. That's a flagship caterpillar if you can have such a thing. It's got eye spots. It looks like a snake. And people think that it is, some people actually really think it is a snake and they ring me up and say they've got this snake in the garden with a horn on the back and it's the caterpillar of the elephant hawk. One of the problems though about the elephant hawk caterpillar is it feeds on willow herb which is fine but also on fuchsia so it does seem to like people's prized fuchsias which it can be a bit of a, a nuisance because it's so, so big it eats an enormous amount of leaf at a time and can cause quite a lot of damage. So it's obtrusive and you can see it a lot but sometimes it's it does upset people. That's the elephant hawk moth. Related to the elephant hawk moth is the poplar hawk moth, another huge species of moth that looks or tries to look like dead leaves. And again, people ring me up and say they've seen this strange looking moth. What no could it possibly be? I remember the first time I saw a poplar hawk. It was on the on the um, the, the fence surrounding my garden when I was uh, uh, a boy. I used to climb over this fence and leap down the other side and go off for walks and things. And so this is what I did. I leapt over as usual and scrambled down the, the, the fence. Suddenly found that I had trodden on a popular hawk moth, the first one I'd ever seen. I was mortified. So that's my first memory of a popular hawk. I'm not surprised we had it, I suppose, because we had a very large poplar tree in the garden as well. And the caterpillar feeds on poplar and willow and sallow and this kind of thing. Related species. Then there's the unrecorded species. 
especially the pug moths, the notorious pug moths. There are 20 or 30 of these species that you very often come across, but there are a lot of them are very small and very, very similar looking, and some of them are even very similar to each other. So the mottled pug and the brindle pug in particular, and the oak tree pug at this time of year are out, or roundabout now are out, very, very similar to each other. And so people tend to think, it's a pug, I'm going to throw it away. So the mottled pug, a common moth, should be recorded a lot, is recorded much less than it should be. So again, if it looks a bit boring and you think it's not worth bothering with, please do, because it might be one of these moths that gets underreported, and we want to know more about it. That's a mottled pug. And the garden tiger, the common or garden tiger. Again, long, long ago in the past, I remember when I was a, a little boy going to school, we used to find lots and lots of garden tiger caterpillars. They're big and they're hairy and they're obviously very easy to see. And we used to collect them. And there were so many of them, we used to run races with them. We had to put them in the street and see which one got to the end of the finishing line first. They were so common. People don't seem to do that anymore for some reason. I don't quite know why. Perhaps it's not the kind of thing you do anymore. But that's what we used to do. And it got us interested in things. It got us interested in moths and, and the wildlife and, and biodiversity as a whole. So the garden tiger was very common then, but for whatever reason, it became less and less common until now it's, well, something I see once or twice a year, but that's about all. So it's, again, you think it was common. So the old books say it's a very common moth, but actually it's much rarer than it used to be. So I don't know what to look for. And I'm always pleased to see this in my trap. You might wonder why it looks like that. Why is it so, so brightly colored? It's so obvious, surely something's going to eat it. What it does, what it tries to do is to frighten away any predators. So it has its wings closed, showing the brown and white at first. And then when it gets, it gets frightened, it opens the wings like that and flashes its orange hind wings at the, uh, the predator, hoping to frighten it away. Not common everywhere, the cloaked carpet. We do really well for cloaked carpet in this, this county in Breckenshire and Mid Wales. It's a, a common moth, but the books say it's rare and, and uh, not to be found in most places of, in the UK, but here it, it is common. And this is the one, of course, you saw before when I showed was showing camouflage moths, very well camouflaged. The caterpillar feeds on um, Solaria, the uh, greatest stitch word. And again, that's a common plant in our hedgerows, and that's probably reason, one reason why it's so common here. But stitch words found all over the country, but the, the, the moth itself is not common everywhere. It's also very similar to a lot of its relatives, so it can be quite difficult to tell this from something like a sharp angled carpet, because that's got sharp angles here as well. You see these, these sharp angles on the, the notches and the, the water forewing. So it can be quite difficult to identify. But it's much more likely to be a cloak carpet in this county because it's so common around, around here. So let's look at some rarities in Breckenshire because we do have some, some species in Breckenshire that you don't see very often anywhere else. There's the first Silurian moth to be recorded in Breckenshire. This moth was discovered in, in Britain in the 1970s near Abitillary in, uh, in Gwent, in Monmouthshire. And from, for many years, for nearly 20 years, it was thought only to exist in one very small area of, that, of, the, of the Black Mountains near Abitillary. Then we started looking for it in, uh, in Breckenshire and, and, and Monmouthshire as well on the, um, the Hatterall Ridge. And for years, we tried really hard to find it. And eventually we did, we found it in, uh, in Monmouthshire. Not far from Breckenshire, but still not in my county. So I really wanted to find it in Breckenshire. So we, we, in 2013, as you can see, we went up there. The caterpillar feeds on um, bilberry in, over the winter and early spring, and it's at its best in April. So you can imagine going up to the top of a mountain, the Black Mountains, and at 11 o'clock at night in the dark, at night time, don't you feed at night, going up there in a really cold weather, to go on your hands and knees looking for this little caterpillar. It was cold, it was wet, it was freezing cold and it was dark. It was the top of the hill and I was tired and we found the thing at last. So I was really pleased about that. So that's one really good moth to find in, uh, in Breckenshire. Since then we found it in one or two other places as well, not, not far away. And in fact, um, just a week ago, I was having a, a Zoom conversation with one or two uh, mothers from around here. And I was talking about the Silurian, how rare it was. Oh, said one guy, I've had it in my garden. Oh, said another guy, so have I. And they live some distance away from each other, but clearly it's to be found more commonly than we think. Now I'm sure it must only be breeding in the tops of the mountains. It probably 
wanders around a bit in the county and comes down to people's garden, which is really nice. Never in my garden, I'm afraid. Wouldn't that be nice? And that's the Silurian moth. I suppose if you found that in your moth shop, you might think, well, it's not terribly exciting, but um, you never know. It doesn't look very exciting, but it would be really exciting to see it in, because it's so rare. Another of my favourite moths, the Welsh clearwing. The clearwings are very strange moths. First of all, because they don't look like moths at all, they, they look like wasps and bees and this, this kind of thing. And that's deliberate. They're trying to, to, um, to fool a predator into thinking there's something dangerous, like a wasp, and they'll, they'll sting you. So they do look like wasps, and of course, people tend to be frightened of them as well because they look so fearsome. But they're not. And almost all of the caterpillars of, of, of clear wings feed in, in wood or bark inside trees and the, they make tunnels of, uh, uh, in, in the holes in the, in the trees. And so they're very difficult to find, very difficult to, to find the caterpillars and to breed them out. And very elusive, they fly in the daytime, but they seem to fly around tops of trees and you very rarely see them. The Welsh clear wing was discovered in Wales, yes, and then was lost in Wales for many, many years. And for a long time, we thought it only existed in England. And it was ironic to find a Welsh clearing of all things only to be found in England. And then about 20 years ago now, it was discovered in North Wales. And since then, it was, we've been looking for it throughout the whole of Mid Wales and finding it in one or two places. And we eventually found it again in Breconshire about 15 years ago, I should think. First, first of all, it was found in Radnorshire, then just over the border to Breconshire. And it's now found commonly in the Allen Valley. Now, I remember the first time I saw one, we went to, to the site that had been found in, in Radnorshire. And we were looking on birch trees because it feeds on birch trees, makes holes in the barks of birch trees, and, and uh, when it comes out, it sits and, and suns itself on the on the bark. And uh, the person I was with said, "Oh, there's a Welsh clearing." And uh, husband, it was, it was actually, it was Pete and Ginny uh, Clark, the county recorders for for Radnorshire. Husband said, "Oh, where is it? I'm just about to put my hand on the tree." And she said, "She said, don't." And he nearly squashed it. Didn't quite. And that's the moth. We, we put it in the bottle and just a photograph of it and let it go, of course. So the Welsh clearing is definitely a, a signal, a, a, a really nice species to be found in this, this county. One of my favourites. And that is what you're looking for as a, a suitable tree for Welsh clearing. It's huge. Because they feed on bark, it has to be thick bark, so the tree has to be old. So they reckon about a metre round is about the smallest size for a, a birch tree. And birch trees don't grow very big, so it's quite hard to find them of that, that size. That's a, a huge old birch tree that's got plenty of little holes of Welsh clearing. There you are, that is what you're looking for. Big birch, big birch tree with holes, circular holes of that size, about, uh, about probably about that size. And that's what, what the emergence, the emergence hole, because the caterpillar burrows in the, or makes tunnels in the, in the wood to, to feed on the bark. And then when it's ready to come out, it makes a hole in the bark to, so that it can actually stick its pupa out. And if you're lucky, you can sometimes see the empty pupal case sticking out of the hole. And in fact, that's a very good way of identifying the, the moth because you don't need to see the moth at all. If you can find the, the pupa, you can identify it because it's got a particular characteristic shape. That's the pupal case of the Welsh clearwing. If you live in Mid Wales or North Wales, go out looking for it. See if you can find it this year. So, how are we doing? We've got plenty of time, haven't we? Right. Recording. I think Ben mentioned this before about please send in your records of any moss you see. And the reason why is we need to know what is present for any species, where, where, is, it, what's, where it is. Do we have it in this county? Do we have it in the area? What is around? What is here? A list of species. Which ones of those are threatened in some way? Are they threatened locally or threatened nationally? And if they are, what are the habitat needs and how are you going to manage for conservation? Some species are probably more valuable than others. I mean, it's, it's a shame to think of anything being becoming extinct, but some species have become extinct because they're, they're migrants. They come in for a few years and the other conditions are just right for them and they, they stay in the they breed for a few years and then they die out again or maybe they, they're pursued by parasites or whatever and go, their numbers go down they become extinct but they may come back again and that's not too much of a of a problem the second type is where you've got a subspecies 
that's, that's only British. And then if you lose our subspecies like the large blue butterfly, then it's gone forever. They've been re reintroduced, but uh, not a British subspecies. So that British subspecies has gone completely. And that's a real shame. What we worst of all, of course, we had a species of, of moth in, in Britain that was, existed nowhere else in the world. And there's only one little micro moth in southern England called Eudonia, Eudacia rizzoni. If that went, that would be a real tragedy. It's the only species of moth that we have that only exists in, in Britain. But that's what I say, management for conservation is what happens next. If you know what you've got and you know how to protect it, then you can, you can manage the, the habitat to protect, to, to, to enable it to, uh, to remain there and to, to flourish. So we need records. That's a, one of my favorite uh, photographs of mine, the figure of eight moth. That's one of the species that has gone down in numbers quite a lot. And uh, I occasionally get in my garden, I'm always pleased to see it when I do. That's one that's declining. So again, this is a record that was mentioned by, by Ben. Moth recording, the vital information. What is it? When did you see it? Where did you see it? And the name of the recorder. It has to be said that nowadays, um, the name of the recorder can be slightly more uh, difficult than it used to be because people now record online and tend to, to put pseudonyms down instead of the name. And that means it's difficult then to, to track back to find out what actually, what actually happened, what actually, whether the, the, the moth was true, what, whether you can verify it. Because if you've got a, a recorder's name, you can go back and talk to the person concerned and find out whether that moth was what they said it was. If you don't have a real name, then you can't do that. And I personally find it a bit of a problem that people provide pseudonyms instead of real names for recorders' names. And the name of the verifier as well is different. Nice to have number seen, whether it was one or 20 or 100. Site information, where it, what kind of site it was, what the habitat was, the weather conditions. They're desirable, but they're not absolutely necessary. Some of the old records, the, the historic records, are really quite deficient in all of that. I know the, the earliest records for Breckenshire by a guy called Williams Vaughan in 1926. is just a list of moths in the Talgarth area. That's all it says. Nothing about habitat, nothing about numbers, just nothing about precise uh, loca location, just in the Talgarth area. But it's, it's data were recorded as such. It was found somewhere near Talgarth. We don't know exactly where. So the, the place, the grid reference is a, quite a difficult thing to, uh, to establish, but it's still historic and valu valuable data. That, by the way, is a moth called a blood vein, and you can see why. It's got a purple veins, apparent vein going along its, its wings, and purple edges to the wings as well. Nice little moth. And then once you've taken the, you've decided what the moth is, how do you store the record? Well, the first thing I do, as you can see, is to write it down in my book. There's a shuttle-shaped dart. Now, it's rather a shame that the shuttle-shaped dart isn't sitting on the word shuttle-shaped dart. It's sitting on the word um, ribboned wave instead, but never mind. It was a good story. It could have been a good story, but it wasn't quite. That's the shuttle-shaped dart. But you can see I've written it down. It might look a bit scruffy, but that's historical data that I can go back to. If I've made a mistake, in transcribing the information from my book to the computer and, and so on, then you can go back to the original information and, and be certain about what I, what I actually saw. It did happen to me uh, just last year. Somebody said, that's an unusual moth to get it that time of year normally, are you sure? So I went back to 1970s and found out that I'd been completely wrong, that I'd given the wrong, the wrong name. I'd thought it was a particular moth and I'd written down on the computer something different. So, it's important to have an audit trail for the, the records that you produce. So you can go back and find out and be certain that you know what it was at, at the time. So if you've got the date, the number and the species, then in, a, in handwritten form, then I think that's very valuable. By all means, put it onto uh, an app or put it onto um, the, your computer uh, through a um, website. By all means do that, but always nice to have the, uh, the original record as well. So that's hard copy. Then what I do per, is to put it onto Excel. Or you can use custom-made software like Mac, MapMate with a data uh, record. And there are other ways as well, which I'll come to in a minute. And it goes to the county moth recorder. That's me in Mechanshire. In the other counties in Mid Wales, for Radnorshire, it's Pete and Ginny Clark. 
and for, for Montgomery Show is Peter Williams. So they're your county recorders who would need to verify your records. Elsewhere in the world, you have to find out for yourself, but you can find out by looking at the Butterfly Conservation website, which gives you a list of all the county moth recorders. So once the records have gone to the, the county moth records, he verifies them, which is not a trivial task. On my database for Breckenshire, I have verified nearly a quarter of a million records, and that takes some doing. Sometimes you can, they're quite easy to, to, to verify, but sometimes they're not. Sometimes you need to do quite a lot of research to be certain about the, 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 um, the species of a moth. And then you can send it by email or MapMate or iRecord. And I recognise, I think it's important that the, that the, uh, the um, online apps and online means for, of directly downloading data are, are used because they're going to be used more and more. We need to be able to deal with that and, and make sure that we can get the, the data flow through and verified and audited so that we understand exactly what's, what, the, um, record, what the record was. So I use iRecord quite a lot. And I, I verify um, uh, moth records with iRecord. So if you put something on iRecord, it will come to me and I can verify it. Or otherwise, it might be that I don't. Maybe I might take issue with the, the, the uh, identification, in which case I'll just say, and actually, I think it's something else. So you get the uh, experience from a county moth recorder that way. Or, as Ben said, you can take it to your local environmental record centre, and that's Biz here. And you can go direct to Biz via Wired or the Lurk app. I've taken to start using, I didn't used to use Wired very much, but I've taken to start using it now and I find it very useful. In fact, it's very, uh, very user friendly. Use of the records. Well, as, as Ben said, Biz uses a Derrin. And now you can, you can uh, go to a Derrin and find out what's in your backyard or anywhere else in, uh, in Wales. Whereas Butterfly Conservation has the National Moth Recording Scheme, an MRS. And that's the, uh, the, the, uh, the way in which the information for the atlas has been provided. Yeah, for various moths, there's a, you can see the, the maps, showing the dots on the maps, exactly where the moth is. So moth numbers and distribution, what, how, how are they doing? How are they, how are they getting on? Are they getting better or worse? Are they increasing? Are they, are they decreasing? So very recently, Butterfly Conservation issued the State of Business Moths, Large Moths 2021. And what it says is that some moths are spreading. The dotted chestnut, for example, two or three years ago, I had it for, my, for the first time in my garden. Now, looking back, I found that it was fairly new in further, further southwest it's been spreading north, north further southeast. It's been spreading northwest from um, England, southern England, and finally reached my garden a couple of years ago. I got one this year as well. That's the dotted chestnut. Nice little moth. Some groups of species are doing well, like the footman, and that's due to cleaner air now. And there are far better uh, um, lichens in particular because the caterpillars of footman uh, moths feed on lichens. So most of the footmen are doing well. Often we wondered what the plural of footman is in terms of moths. Do you call them footmen or footmen? I call them footmen, but I may be wrong. And then some of them have done very much less well. The pale shining brown, which used to be fairly well, well recorded at least, is now thought to be extinct in Britain. So for whatever reason, some are doing well and some are not. And um, the uh, National Moth Recording Scheme has, has charted the, the ups and downs of those species over the years. What are the common moths? How common are the various species? Are they going up or down? And we do need statistically proven evidence. That's a, co a common moth. If you do any moth trapping in June and July, you'll come across this in huge numbers, the heart and dart. It's called the heart and dart because it's got a heart-shaped mark and a dart-shaped mark, and another one as well there. Very common. So we set up the garden moth scheme to try and find out what's going on for common garden moths all around the whole of the UK and Ireland as well. And since 2007, there have been 300 recorders and 300 gardens sending information in. Different gardens, of course, because people come and go. 
but we've had three, 300 sets of records or more every year since 2007. That's the beautiful, that's the plain golden eye. I like the, these uh, it's, it's records, uh, it's, it's uh, relatives, it's got a nice haircut, I think, very attractive. So Garden Mosque in Wales, these are from 2005, actually I started down here in 2005 and we threw it open through the whole of the UK from 2007 onwards and that's these are all the people, all the sites that have been recorded in Wales since that time. 103, 100 recorders, 58 are still active, 13 vice counties, so you see we've got dots in all the vice counties and 216,000 records, probably more than that now as they're always going up. So we, we, we do contribute quite a lot in Wales to the, garden, the whole garden moss scheme. And just, uh, just to, to show you how things are doing in Wales, the garden moss scheme week one to nine, occurring in March and April, this is what people recorded. So the 45 gardens in Wales that were recorded, a total of 1,762 Hebrew characters. In 2020, that's an average of 39.16, or 39 moths per garden. But does that mean everybody had 39 moths in those nine weeks? No, it doesn't. Of course it doesn't. And I've just noted down. Of the 45 recorders who sent in records for these, all these species, one person had two moths, a total of two garden, hey, Hebrew characters. In the, the whole of the, in the nine weeks, they only had two moths in their trap, two Hebrew characters in their trap. Whereas one other person had 182. So an average of 39 is just just that an average. The actual numbers that people got in their gardens individually vary enormously. The common Quaker, several people had none at all, but one person had 66 moths, average of 15. The um, clouded drab, Again, some, uh, one or two people had none at all, whereas one person had 74. And the small Quaker, which is notoriously variable in numbers, so, several people had none, and one person had 95. That pales into insignificance compared to the person who I heard about in um, the Wye Valley this year, who had 700 small Quakers in her moth trap, and their moth trap. Can you imagine having 700 of the same species in your, in your trap? I mean, you'd be absolutely inundated. I've never had 700 in mind, but I certainly had 200. It's, um, it's quite, a, uh, quite a, an undertaking to count them all. And you can't get any, because they're flying around, of course, as well, because there, there's so many of them, they inter, in, interrupt each other and they interfere with each other, and they fly around in the trap as well, and it's, uh, it's a nightmare. And you can also tell from one year to the next how, thing, how moths did. So almost all species did better in 2019, the year before than it did in 2020. 2020 was a fairly poor year, so the numbers have gone down. So average of, for Hebrew characters, the average of 66 in 2019 and 39 in 2020. One or two did well. The muslin moth went up from 0.98 to 2.62, a 168% increase, but that's because it was flying earlier in the year. In, in 2019, it started flying after the end of, in the large numbers, after the end of the, the period. So you get a few anomalies of this kind when the, the period changes. Otherwise, almost all of them were less common in 2020 than they were in 2019, which itself doesn't mean a great deal. It's just a matter of weather conditions, but it's interesting at least. One or two have done particularly badly. The twin spotted quick had a very poor year in 2020, only one and a half per, per garden. And I think we're getting near the end now. So what I'm going to do, what we're going to do now is have a, a little video. Please excuse the quality of the video. We're, we're just amateurs, aren't we, Ben? Just amateurs. We try our best to uh, produce uh, something live for you to, to look at. Normally, in another year, we'd, we'd have uh, been showing you the, the moths in real life outside. This year we can't, so the very next best, best thing was a video of setting up the trap, emptying the trap, and uh, recording, and then letting them go. So you can have a look to see how we do. A good way of catching moths is a moth trap using ultraviolet light and this is my moth trap. It's called a Skinner type of trap and it has the ultraviolet bulbs here. I like to put my trap in a sheltered place, sheltered from the wind and often beside a hedge as well because the moths like to fly along hedge lines I find. 
That's why I put my chop in this corner of the garden. There are different types of moth trap. This is the Skinner type. There's also a heath trap, which is a smaller one and more more portable with use with batteries. And there are there are um, there's also the Robinson trap, which is a, a bigger one, and which very often uses a mercury vapor tube. That's even brighter than the the actinic tubes which these are. <laughs> it's important to remember that moths, when they are attracted to your trap, they need somewhere to rest overnight, and so you put in egg boxes. Egg boxes have the property that they've got rough edges inside, and the moths seem to like to rest on those rough edges. You open the trap like this and put the egg boxes in. Everybody has their own special way of putting in egg boxes. I have one near the bottom like this. And the second layer. And I put a second layer here. And then a third layer of dangle. I know. And the same on the other side. When I empty my moth trap in the morning, I always like to put it on the table so it doesn't bend down too far. So I carry it from over there where I, where I set it to here to empty. Getting the egg box out. And this moth is the Brindle the Beauty moth. One of the bigger moths that you get at this time of year. And um, it has a, a relative called a pale brindle beauty, which is one of the earliest moths in the spring. This one comes out in March and April. Now there's a moth on this egg box. I can see it. And it's the Hebrew character. This is the commonest moth you get at this time of the year, you can get quite a lot put in one one trap sometimes. This is the common Quaker, probably the second most common of the spring moths after the Hebrew character. There are five or six very common moths at this time of year. There's the Hebrew character, the common Quaker, the small Quaker, the twin spotted Quaker, and the clouded drab, all very closely related. There's also another moth, the early gray. And in fact, this looks like, and it is an early gray. That's the early grey moth. This one's particularly fond of sitting outside the trap, on walls and fences beside your trap. So this, this is sometimes the only moth you'll see outside. Something on there. Oh. Nothing on there. However, I can see two moths that haven't actually landed on the egg boxes and are in the, inside the trap. So I'll take a tube and we'll see what we can find. Here is the early grey. She's warming up in the sunshine. If I put on an egg box, it might be easier to see. Mm -hmm. 
almost the same colour as the egg box. And of course it's very um, well camouflaged if it lands on a trunk of a tree. This is the brindled beauty moth, probably one of the biggest moths that you find at this time of year. It's um, related to the small, the pale brindle beauty, which flies earlier in the year. It's one of the few moths that flies in February. This is the brindle beauty itself. As you can see, it'd be well camouflaged against the trunk of a tree. This is the common Quaker moth. You can see it's got large, very almost circular uh, markings on the wing. It's quite variable in colour. Sometimes it's greyish and sometimes it's darker than this. One of the very commonest moths at this time of year. Common Quaker. This is the early grey moth. It's one of the commonest moths you find at this time of year. And very often you find it on the outside of the trap or against a, a fence or, a, or a, a tree trunk. But you find it inside the trap as well. The early grey. This is the Hebrew character moth, so-called because it has a, a Hebrew type character on its wing. It's the very commonest of the spring moths. One thing about recording in the spring, there are relatively small numbers of different species, so it's easy to get started in the spring. I always recommend that new beginners start recording moths in spring this time of year. The Hebrew character flies between March and April. As county moth recorder, I make sure that I get all the records from everybody who counts moths in, in Breckenshire. And there are various ways in which you can submit records. You can just send them to me if you wish, or you can put them onto the Lilk Wales app, or you can put them onto iRecord. However, however you do it, they come to me and I then verify each one. But in Radnorshire, the county moth records are Pete and Ginny Clark, and in Montgomeryshire, it's Peter Williams. So send your records to them if you're in those counties. At the end of the trapping session, we let the moths go. It's always a good idea to find a place to let them go that won't be, won't be vulnerable to birds. So I let mine go in this hedge. And sometimes they refuse to leave their hiding places here and you have to stop them quite hard. And now it's gone. And it's gone down somewhere into the, into the hedge. And here's a Hebrew character going. And another Hebrew character. There we go. And finally, an early grey and two more Hebrew characters. And you can see, or well you can't see them now because they've hidden themselves inside the hedge. Okay, so that was our short video. Um, as Norman said, we're very amateur filmmakers, so um, hope you found that useful and saw some uh, moth trapping in action. Uh, it's always useful to see it actually happening rather than just on some slides. So. <clears throat> Hope that was useful. Um, we'll do the questions and answers now. It's not too well. I can see one question, Norman. So we have got one, and also a comment that we had as well, Norman. When you were showing the books from your bookshelf, uh, not everyone could see those because obviously they only appeared on your uh, video feed. So I'm just wondering if you were able to to show the books again and just go through the titles of them. So go, that's the first one, Norman, go ahead. The Field Guide to the Moths of Great Britain and Ireland. I'm reading it backwards because I've got a mirror image on my screen, but there we are. And it's by Waring and Townsend. That's the one with the, if I can find the right pages, with the drawings and paintings of the, the moths. That's one. The second one is British Moths, second edition. Get the second edition or wait for the third edition, which will be coming out soon. And it's by Manley, Chris Manley. Oh, yeah, that's his name, Chris Manley. And the third one, which I use, but many people don't. is Skinner, Colour Identification Guides to Moths of the British Isles by Bernard Skinner. And the moths are shown set. 
I know. I mean, you see the hand rings, which is, which is, of course, is um, sometimes characteristic. Sometimes the hand ring is what tells one moth from another. And I also showed the atlas. So for beginners, it's not necessarily the first book to buy. I find it a mine of information showing you where the must be found. And that's the Atlas of Britain and Ireland's larger moths. I don't wish to um, be pushing one particular uh, seller, but I tend to use Atropos books. They have, have all of these for sale. Does that your question? Yeah, thanks, Norman. Um, just wanted to make sure that everyone could see those books and maybe about buying one if you want to get into moth trapping. Which one, if you were going to buy one of those as a very beginner, what which one would you recommend, Norman? I, I, I think the ones, I know there's one that shows a life-size image of the moth, so what you will see in the moth trap or on your hand or wherever is matched by the size in the book. Is, is that you're a good probably, feature? You're, you're probably book? right, Ben, you're probably right. I, I suppose, I mean, I use this very little personally. I suppose for a beginner, that may be the best one to buy. Wearing in Townsend. The Wearing in Townsend, okay, that's good to know. But should right. you, should, should you, even as a beginner, should you get into the really interesting moths, the micros, then you would need to have, so you would need to have Manly because Manly has the micros in as well. The really nice moths, the micros. I know not everybody likes them because they're very small and quite difficult to identify sometimes, but um, I find them very interesting. Thanks, Norman. There's a couple of questions about moth traps, and um, Heather asks, well, asks both these questions. Um, which moth trap is best for a beginner? So you've got the book now. Um, now it's time to go and buy your beginner moth trap, which would you recommend? And then also about leaving the moth trap light on. And it, I can confirm that, yes, you leave it on all night. But Heather asks if you leave the light switched on all night. Well, that's, that's a, 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 an important part because one of the reasons that would influence your choice of which trap to buy is the extent to which your neighbours might be upset by the fact that you've got your night, night trap on all, all night. The very brightest one gets the most moths, and that would be a Robinson trap with a, uh, with a mercury vapour bulb. Very bright, very attractive to moths, plenty of moths, but um, can cause disturbance. Then the next one down is the Skinner trap, with, uh, be a Robinson trap with an MV is the, the big one. The next one down would be a Skinner trap with an actinic bulb. For years and years and years, I used a Skinner trap with a, a 15 watt actinic bulb and it's been brilliant. But it's, it's not nearly as bright as the other ones. It also uses less electricity. So should you happen to have problems with your electricity supply, if you're, if you're on renewables, for example, or in a generator or whatever, then you might have difficulty with, uh, with that. I know one or two of, of my recorders do have that kind of problem. So the actinic is, is less bright and certainly I don't have any problem with it uh, disturbing neighbors. The heat trap with the, um, the smaller actinic is even, use even less power and you usually have a battery with that and it's, it's very good for, for mobile traps if you want to go into the, into the local countryside. But for a, an absolute beginner, I would probably say, I suggest you might use the Skinner with an actinic bulb. Okay. Um, Jane asks, and this is another option for a beginner, um, can you make your own moth trap? So just use a a light on the end of a, a lead maybe and then put that in a on top of a box and with egg boxes in so you can kind of create your own if you're inventive and that would probably be a cheaper a cheaper route to starting moth trapping yeah my first moth trap many years ago was a bucket and um and a sugar puff packet i made the made the, the funnel out of a sugar puff packet and uh, a bucket and a, a, an actinic bulb with a, a battery in the bottom that was it so yes, you can. I mean, I wouldn't recommend that, of course, but it just shows you can you can do something. Um, 
the other thing you can do if you don't want to go to the extent of, of buying a moth trap is have a um, ultraviolet light, small one perhaps, on a sheet. And then you can see the moths coming in and just, you wouldn't need that overnight, you just have it in, in the dark, in the, in the evening. And again, that's, that was the, when I first started, I, that's what I used. But you know, I would recommend a Skinner trap with uh, a clinic to start off with. But you can make your own, you can buy kits to make these, uh, these traps. Or you can, you can just as, as Ben said, you can put the ultraviolet light on, on the top of a, a box. But you need to have some means of, of, um, of putting the, the plastic polystyrene um, slopes in, because they need to go into the in, into the, the trap through a, almost like a, a funnel of some kind. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, yeah. I guess you could look at a design, say the Skinner trap, which is quite a simple design, and um, yeah, it should be fairly easy to, um, to make your own. Um, I suppose that the funnel type device with the ski slope perspex sides, they, the aim of those is to trap the moths inside so that you leave the trap out all night, get up in the morning and they're still in there. Um, maybe with some of the homemade ones you might just put it out and then go and check it regularly or stand around it as you might do with a sheet and the light and then just identify them if you can as they appear. So, um, yeah, I guess um, make your own if you can and you want to and see if it's a hobby that you want to get into. Because um, I think a Skinner, how much would you pay for a Skinner trap, Norman, with an actinic light? What sort of price? All in, probably about 150. Yeah, so it's not a small you, outlay. So, yeah, maybe it's worth Hang on a sec. If you really want to start at the very, very beginning, what you do is you, you get a torch and you go out at night and you look at your buddleia or, or your nectar source, if you've got buddleia in your garden or some kind of um, uh, plant that has good nectar sources, then the moths will be attracted to that. That, that. that starts without any outlay at all apart from a torch. And for many people that's sufficient. You can go and see what's coming into your, your, your uh, nectar source throughout the night. Or you can look at the what's on your window, of course, just do the washing up. I always tell kids when I'm, when I'm saying to um, I'm giving a talk to, to children. You do the washing up for your parents, don't you? And you see the uh, the moss on the window, and they look at me as though I'm. They don't know what I'm talking about. No, they don't do the washing. Of course, they don't. Got machines for that. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, I'll, I do the washing up, and I'll look out for moths next time I'm doing it at night, Norman. Well, you get to, you get very adept at identifying a moth from the underside. Hmm. Oh, yes, because you see the underside from see the, the underside. Side that's, that's, yeah, yeah. that's a good idea. I know someone who, um, I don't know whether it's true, but if you leave your bathroom light on, leave the window wide open, you can turn your bathroom into a moth trap. But then, of course, you've got to chase them around the, the bathroom to catch them, to identify them if they're not sitting nice. The, the, the rare ones always disappear. The really exciting yeah. ones, they always disappear. They always fly away. They always or go, go down behind something. I think they do that deliberately to make you put the trap out again the following night to see if you can catch it the next night <laughs> as well. So it's a, it's a ploy they have. Absolutely. Uh, Don asks about the waterproofness of traps and are they waterproof? Very good question. Um, if you have something that, I mean, I find the, in particular, the, the uh, actinics can be very good. You can have a very good waterproof seal at, at each end. So if you, if you buy them from one of the dealers, you expect to get something that really is waterproof. I, the, the reason why my, my wooden Skinner trap didn't last all that long, a mere 10 years, was that I left it out, rain, shine, 365 days a year, in the snow and everything else, all, all exposed to the elements. And eventually, sort of the, the wet got into the, the electro, electronics and, uh, and did, for the, um, did for them. But yes, they, you can get very waterproof ones, very weatherproof ones. The, the, the probably the most, damaging weather condition is wind. Very strong wind can blow, blow, blow your water over um, or blow the perspex sheets out. So that's the, the one, perhaps the one thing to worry about. Um, also, rain can be an issue when your egg boxes get soaking wet. So what I do is I put oasis or something of that kind or a sponge at the bottom, uh, underneath, the, uh, underneath the, the valley to catch the water. 
But moths fly in the rain, by the way. I don't know if you noticed that, but they do. They will, even when it's raining, moths will fly. Yeah, so I was going to mention the tip about soaking up the, the water. So rain will get into the trap, just as the moths are kind of funneled in. Also water will. And yeah, if it's going to be a particularly wet wet night, it's a good idea to, to raise your egg boxes off the kind of ground of the trap by using a yeah, sponge or um, oasis, the thing that you'd put flowers in. So um, uh, yeah, some, some good little tips there. But yeah, yes, you, will catch, you will catch moths when it's wet. Absolutely. And, and sometimes, in fact, um, a wet night is a good night because it's, it's, it's not so cold. The clouds are there and they keep, they keep the, the temperature up. And sometimes really, really nice can be quite good. And yes, I saw somebody ask, can you put a stone in the bottom? Yes, you can. I sometimes don't have done that. Put a, a half brick in the bottom, that stops it blowing away. What it doesn't do, though, is to prevent the, um, the perspex from blowing off. And I remember seeing a, a, a very clever design by somebody in north of Scotland who were in a, living in a very windy place who had um, clip, uh, clips attached to his perspex to, to actually clip it onto the, the, the wooden part of the, the trap so they didn't blow away. Oh, something like a peg or something. That's yeah, a good idea. That's, right, yeah. Yeah. that's good. So, yeah, oasis, sponges, and stones in your trap to counteract any adverse weather conditions. Absolutely. Um, We've got a comment here from Jane, and she says that she used to get many large moths in North Radnorshire, but she sees very few now. Um, she's seen the red underwing, the yellow underwings, and a large emerald she saw in the daytime in summer. And I'm guessing last summer, last year. Um, but she sees very few large moths at night. Uh, are you finding that, the moth, the larger moth species? I don't know exactly what species she means by larger moths but is there you, you notice a reduction 2019 to 20 but is there a more general decline in moths over the years um probably there's been a decline in the long term probably from the 1960s and 70s onwards there probably has been but certainly in the last 10 years or so numbers have remained fairly stable the different species have changed slightly. Some moths have come in and other moths have, have disappeared somewhat. But in general, we've, we've looked over the last 10 years and numbers are more or less the same from one, one year to the next. In, over a long period of time, the trend is flat in Wales. But, certain, but perhaps in the 1960s and 70s, there may be more moths to be, to be found, certainly. Okay. And Jane also asks about golden moths that she's seen in amongst bracken. So she says, what are the golden bracken moths likely to be? Is that, can you give a species or possibility for those? It sounds to me like the gold swift. Golden swift. The gold swift. Gold swift, okay. And that is a moth that does seem to have declined somewhat. Um, but where you come across it, or it may just be under-recorded because people don't tend to record moths flying around, in, around bracken. I know I saw quite a lot of them a few years ago when I went to visit one of our recorders near um, Osavata. And we went and had a look at the woodland there and there was a lot of bracken in the woodland. And this moth was very common. So it may be still around. Okay, thanks for that. Um, yeah, we heard quite, I was quite um, interested to hear about your childhood during your talk, Norman, and all the experiences you had with moths and finding moths and um, sugar puffs for breakfast to build moth trap with. Um, and Jane also says that she was a child in the 60s and she remembers that there was a lot more moths back then, like 60s, 70s. So yeah, I think like a lot of species, we've seen a decline in the last 30, 40 years. And yeah, gold swift is the one to look for around Bracken. So hopefully Jane might be able to spot and identify the gold swift and maybe even make some records using the Lurk Wales app or iRecord. And if you're looking at bracken by the way um, you might find the caterpillar on it which is a stripy yellow and, and brown and that's the broom moth caterpillar one of the few that you get commonly on bracken. Okay so bracken yes I, I often tell people that bracken is a useful food plant for several moths and um, yeah, the gold swift and the broom moth, they both feed on, well, the caterpillars of those both feed on bracken. 
as of the brown silver line. Okay, so there's three to look for around Brecon. Excellent. Um, well, I think we've got one taker to start moth trapping. Hazel says that she's going to start trapping again soon. Well, Whether that's a, I guess that's a, someone who has trapped before and not got back into it. But um, yeah, I put our trap out for the first time last night and it's gone out again tonight because it's going to be a little bit milder. So hopefully we'll get a few more moths flying tonight than the one that I had last night. Um, Kay's um, in, uh, writing down about her experience on Flatholm in 2008, so 12 or so years ago, and she found a Jersey tiger in our trap. I think that would have made you squeak if you'd have got one of those, would it, Norman? Are they pretty rare? Well, it would, but not if I'm in South Wales. The very South, south Wales, it's, it's um, something that has spread from Jersey to the southwest of England, <coughs> the south coast of England, now it's on the south coast of Wales as well. It's spreading. Right. It has come into Wales, so yeah, yes, look out for that, that one moving north. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they are becoming more common in Wales, which is Kay asks about that. Have yeah. you had one? Have you had one, Norman? Uh, not, not, not in my garden, no. No. So they kind of not made it over the mountains yet, over the hills, the beacons. We well, can very often be the very last place on, on the whole of Britain to get some of these uh, migrant species coming in. They don't, as you say, they don't seem to climb over the mountain very well. Yeah, because we're because. How is Brecon Beacon National Park is landlocked? Yeah, a lot yeah. of things don't don't get over to us. Um, they come in obviously via the coast, so um, that's good. Um, and Don asks about suppliers where you can buy moth traps from. Um, I know you've got one supplier that you is it Angles Park or something that you. Well, I I I'm not don't think you want to put that down as part of the the the. Um... The written uh, material, but I'm quite happy to say that there are, there are two that I would particularly uh, recommend as being leading manufacturers. One is Anglian Lepidopteris Supplies, and the other one is Watkins and Doncaster. Anglian Lepidopteran, as in East Anglian, that's as in yeah. East Anglian, isn't it? Exactly, yes. And Ang I mean, if, Watkins if you... and Doncaster. Anglian Lepidopterist Supplies and Watkins and Doncaster. Yeah, so two websites for uh, Don to have a look at there and choose his trap, hopefully, get you into moth trapping. Um, and Jane asks about historical records. Are records from five, six years ago still relevant? Are they, like, can you, I'm not yes, quite sure are. what she means by that, but are historical records 2015 to 2020 still relevant? I guess yes. they will show a trend over a short period of time, won't they? I am. Um... Some years ago, I found from an antique shop uh, a collection of moths going back to the 1900s, and in fact, going back to the 18, 1890s. And they had the great thing about them was that they still had their data labels on them. So they had the information about when they were and when they were caught, going all the way back there. And I submitted those to the county recorder, the Somerset County Recorder. They are very valuable, so you can understand what used to be there, and maybe it still is there. So it's, it's, it's always really interesting to know what used to be at a particular place, because you can sometimes go back and find them again. So yes, absolutely, all records are valuable. Okay, yeah, all records are valuable, and um, yeah, definitely, if you've got records going back over time, they might not be recent, but they do give us important information. So yes, yes um, definitely do, and it seems as though Jane's got some old photos Zoom of moths and hopefully Jane you can make some uh, some biological records maybe using the Lurk Wales app or on iRecord and if you do have a photo of your moth or whatever wildlife you want to record then do add it to your record the apps and the online sites allow you to do this really easily and that helps people like Norman to verify that it is that moth or that um, species of wildlife that you have seen so um, yeah hopefully we'll, we'll start getting some more records. Um, James just asks about the names of the textbook supplier so I guess the two sites the Anglian Lepidopterist supplier. No, that's, 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 that's equipment. Textbook is Atropos, A-T-R-O-P-O-S. Ah, Atropos for the um, books. Yeah. Yeah, all right, okay, I missed that one. I remember saying it earlier. So yeah, thanks for asking that, James. So um, hopefully you'll be able to find the suitable book on the Atropus website. 
Um, I think that's it. I noticed in your talk, Norman, you didn't say about the um, uh, What's Flying Tonight website, which is one that I use a fair bit. And it gives you the moths that are likely to be flying in your area. So it, it kind of knows your location or you can put your location in, I think, and it will look at the time of year. It knows the time of year. Um, I'm just posting that in the chat now. So maybe have a look at this. Have you ever used the What's Flying Tonight website app? Norman? Well, I, I, I know what's flying. I've been you, doing it's it in your brain, isn't it? Yeah, you already I'm know. Yeah. I've been in, in my house for 35 years now, and I've been recording for those 35 years, so I, I know what to expect. I can look back over my records and find out what, what was flying in 1989 or whatever it was. Yeah, so you don't need to use it, but I think for a beginner, I find it oh, yes. quite useful yeah, to, to have a look, and you can, it narrows down the likely species that you're going to have in the moth trap, which is really good. Yes, I, I should have mentioned it. You're quite right. It, it is useful. Yeah, OK, that's good. And Norman also mentioned a website called Aderin, which is different to the BIS website. Um, and Aderin is an all Wales website database of all the wildlife records that we've had submitted to us, maybe using the app or online or sent on spreadsheets. Um, for the whole of Wales and you can actually take a look at some of the information on there um, you can visit a Derin. I'm posting the um, web address up there now and you'll see a tool called what's in my area and if you click on the what's in my area tool you can click on a map and or put in your postcode or if you know where you are in the grid reference and it will show you all the, the species, all the wildlife that's been recorded in that one kilometre area of Wales, so one kilometre grid square and then you can narrow it down to moths for example and then you can have a look at all the different moths that have been recorded at some point in the area where you live or work or maybe are visiting so have a look at Aderin as well, that's where our, all our records, including the moth ones, end up eventually. It's a big sort of all Wales database, it's got about 15 million records on there, so obviously it's always increasing because people keep adding to it. But it, it gives you a good summary of what, what wildlife has been recorded in your area. And it also might alert you to the fact that, oh, nobody's recorded this, and then it might um, encourage you to to actually record some of the wildlife that is missing so that's um a derin and the tool is called what's in my area I posted that up there now so do have a look at that um i think that's it for all the questions do try to use the app the lurk wales app or i record both the app and online that i record to record all the wildlife you see, and in particular the moths that um, hopefully have been inspired to trap and look out for by Norman's talk this evening. Um, also, for information, have a look at our website, bis.org.uk, which I've just posted in the chat now, and that will give you links to the Find an Expert section. So in our area, Powys and Brecon Beacons National Park, we've got three moth experts, one for Montgomeryshire, Peter Williams, two in Radnorshire, uh, Pete and Ginny Clark, and then in Breconshire, we've got Norman, and you can find a link on the find an expert section, and there'll be contact forms for, for those if you want to um, uh, get in touch, and I know Norman is very happy to receive some photos and can help you with the ID, and I'm um, I'm hoping that the other two in Radnorshire and Montgomeryshire are equally as um, available. So do have a look at that. And so I do know that Pete and Ginny do, uh, Ben. Yeah, OK, that's good to know. Yeah, they're, they're Because good. If, if they're stuck, they send them to me. All oh, right, so you're the, you're, <laughs> the, you're the one that verifies everyone's records almost. I wouldn't say that, but um, oh. we, uh, we, we share, we share uh, experiences. Yeah, that's great. Good stuff. I know you're quite um, competitive over your areas, but it's nice to know that you, do, you are collaborative as well. Of course so we are. That's of good course. to hear as well. Um, I'm just going to ask one last question um, and then we'll call it a night. We've just gone past nine o'clock. Um, I always call the popular hawk moth the privet hawk moth. 
is that am I wrong or do they actually feed on privet? Some people just call it privet rather than popular oak moth. They are two very different moths. The privet moth right. feeds on privet and looks a bit like a, a convolvulus hawk moth, a huge great thing, and it's very rare in, in Breckenshire. Right, okay. So I need to. The, is the common one is the poplar hawk moth that feeds on poplar and salad. Okay. Great, I shall um, have to remember that. Thanks for that, Norman. I've learned something as well tonight, as I usually do on these talks. So, yeah, we'll call it a night now. Thanks, Norman, for sharing your experience. and Thank you for organising it all, and thanks, everybody, for, for being uh, patient with our uh, attempts to uh, get things across. Yeah, I think we've um, inspired a few people to start recording and to look into moth trapping, and, um, yeah, hopefully we'll get some more records and we'll have a better idea of what's living where and how all these different species are doing. So, um, and we'll meet again in July. And yes, if you want to come back for more, um, sometime in July, it will be on our website in the events section. Have a look at that and um, you're very welcome to come back in July. Um, if you have been moth trapping, maybe you can share some of the moths that you have had in your trap in the next two or three months. That'd be, that'd be good to see. Uh,